Hello, um, and you know, thanks, Rosalie, for that um, great introduction. And I guess I just want to reiterate my thanks to people like Jessica Blaustein, who has really done an incredible job in helping organize this event, um, as well as everyone else at the Architectural League who um, has helped us realize this. Um, we've got an incredible three days, we think. Um, tonight, Omar Khan, myself, and Trevor Schultz will be giving just a short overview of uh, some of the basic ideas and an introduction to the territory that we hope to be able to cover uh, tomorrow through a series of panel presentations and uh, discussions um, with really what we think are an incredible group of people who come from all over the world to be here for these three days. On Saturday evening, there will be a short um, uh, performance over at i uh, located on 20th Street in Chelsea. And uh, we hope that you, some of you can join us there as well. Um, so let me start right off. One of the first things I want to uh, mention really is that uh, we've established a feedback channel. So uh, I think Rosalie uh, hesitated from saying this, but uh, we ask you to actually keep your cell phones on tonight and uh, perhaps uh, turn them to vibrate maybe. But um, if you have the capabilities with your uh, phone to send an SMS um, message to an SMS message to uh, feedback at situatedtechnologies.net. Um, we'd really encourage uh, that. Um, we'll be drawing from that and some of the questions that uh, will follow uh, the three short presentations by uh, myself, Omar Khan, and Trevor Schultz. Okay, finally, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, the generous support as well of the um, uh, School of Architecture and Planning at the University of Buffalo and the Department of Media Study as well. Okay, so then let's get to it. What are situated technologies? Uh, what do we mean uh, in invoking this term? Um, and you know, perhaps what do they have to do with architecture? Uh, when we began thinking about the subject of the symposium, we identified two senses of the word situa situated that we wanted to work with. Um, the first has to do with technologies that are located or situated in a particular spot or position. Um, these concern the particularities of a given place and the socio-cultural meanings that accrue there. Um, the second sense concerns the notion of actions, uh, particularly actions of people. Uh, here we were drawn to Lucy Sukman's critique of artificial intelligence research uh, circa 1987. Um, AI research at that time was based on the idea that purposeful human activity proceeds according to a preconceived plan which is perfunctorily executed and able to be reasoned about in objective terms. Sukman, on the other hand, argued that purposeful human activity proceeded not according to a preconceived plan, but rather by ad hoc, moment-to-moment -moment interactions between people and between people and the environment within which these actions unfolded. Uh, plans in this context become representations of these situated actions produced either before or after the fact to help us understand that course of action. And she references an um, article by Thomas Gladwin, 1964, which contrasted the methods of navigation between uh, the Tur Turkeys, Truckees navigators, and those of the European uh, navigators. Um, Gladwin notes the European navigator begins with a plan or a course which has been charted according to universal principles, and he carries out his voyage by relating every move to this plan. His or her effort throughout the journey is to remain on the course. In if une unexpected events occur, um, they must alter first the plan and then proceed accordingly. Uh, by contrast, the Truckees navigator, uh, however, begins with an objective rather than a plan. Um, the uh, Truck Islands are located in the uh, North Pacific Ocean, uh, in and around the Caroline Islands. And um, I don't have a pointer, but just uh, pretty much right in the center there, which is this within this uh, island archipelago, um, the movements of uh, these navigators were between from island to island, and um, they set off toward a particular objective and respond to the conditions as they arise in an ad hoc fashion, right? So uh, the navigator in this context utilizes information provided by the wind, the tide, and current. Oh, 
it was a snake, it would have bitten him, wouldn't it? Right? There we go. So there's the truck elements right there. Um, so navigating through the, you know, in, in this fashion, um, quite often the, s uh, the conditions at hand, uh, you know, such as the wind, the tide, and the current, uh, the fauna, the stars, clouds, even the sound of water on the side of the boat uh, become cues by which uh, one's able to navigate from island to island. Uh, if asked in this context, he or she can't point to their objective at any moment, but at any time, uh, they, they can point to the objective at any moment, but cannot describe the actual course itself, right? Uh, these are what's called, what are called stick charts, which are essentially abstractions of the tidal currents and ocean swells of a particular part of this uh, island arch archipelago. Um, the diagrams are not actually used while navigating. They're something which are memorized in advance, <coughs> excuse me, and used to, to decipher the moment-to-moment -moment cues the ocean provides along their ad hoc course. Okay, so then situated technologies incorporate an awareness of cultural context, uh, accrued social meanings, and the temporality of the spatial experience. They privilege the local context-specific and spatially contingent dimension of their use. Um, so as opposed to, uh, for instance, Manuel Castell's uh, placeless space of flows, we find um, you know, a situated, uh, located uh, condition that we're addressing. So rather than a kind of universal technology, we're looking at a very uh, situated technology. Rather than an any time or any place technology, we're looking at technologies designed for responsive places. Okay, now, since the late 80s, computer scientists and en engineers have been researching ways of embedding computational intelligence into the built environment. Researchers at Xerox PARC <laughs> uh, began to look beyond the model of personal computing, which placed the computer in the foreground of our attention, to one of ubiquitous computing, or pervasive computing, that takes into account the natural human environment and allows the computers themselves to vanish into the background. In 1991, Scientific American published an article by Mark Weiser, The Computer for the 21st Century, <coughs> calling for computational devices to become invisible and shifting the focus away from solitary, immersive virtual environments to a more socially integrated context. Uh, this shift involved a new model for human interaction with computers that takes into account the spatial contingencies of everyday life. Uh, this shift was predicated on the development of tiny, inexpensive microprocessors and wireless sensor nets, which today, in fact, have become ubiquitous. Um, for example, the radio frequency identification, uh, uh, identification tags, RFID tags, have already begun to replace standard UPC barcodes on products and packages. We're all probably very familiar with them. Um, in fact, they've been used uh, for some years now to track cattle and things like railroad cars. Um, RFID tags are powered by the mag magnetic field generated by an RFID reader, and the tag's antennas <coughs> excuse me, picks up the magnetic energy, and the tag then modulates the, this field to uh, retrieve and transmit data back to the reader, which then directs it normally to a host, host computer. Um, we're probably, some of, some of us are probably familiar with this in the context of commuting on the easy pass. Um, so last year, uh, the UN released a report by the Interna International Telecommunications Union and uh, predicting an, I an internet, so-called internet of things. Uh, Bruce Sterling has also written about uh, this idea, at least in his book, Shaping Things, and I think some people will be addressing that in the coming days. Um, so the Internet of Things is projected as a condition where the users of the Internet, users in quotes, will be counted in billions, right? And where humans themselves may become the minority as generators and receivers of information. RFID tags, tiny embedded microprocessors, wireless sensor networks, network databases, and tracking technologies such as GPS are being linked together to map the affordances of the Internet onto real things in the physical world. Now, it's not hard to imagine uh, the applications for this coming technology, right? Here's this video here is by UK artist Chris Oakley projecting a near future scena scenario in a shopping mall. Um, clearly, issues of privacy, who has access to this information, and what it's used for are paramount in thinking about the design of these technologies, and particularly their application in the context of the physical world. Um, 
And now, if ubiquitous technologies are already finding their place in ordinary everyday life, then perhaps the most common place where we can expect them to proliferate uh, is that of the city, right? The city has always been a site of interaction and exchange between people, uh, exchange of goods, services, and ideas. Um, and the movements and activities of people in cities intersect on a variety of levels with flows of information and media sources, all of which are in the process of becoming integrated into ever more capable network systems. Um, so beyond the metropolis of the industrial era, right, the so-called metopolis of the digital era emerges. You know, the city, now a place of places, um, where numerous models of uh, urban models coexist, each with its own qualities that make it different from the rest of it. Right? In the, in the metropolis, the dwelling becomes a place where we live, work, and rest, um, and where the neighborhood itself is a multi multinational environment of direct relation between citizens, and where zoning no longer has any meaning. So within this context, you know, what might these uh, thinking about a kind of near future condition for these technologies have to do with architecture? Or said in another way, what might architecture have to do with situated technologies? Um, what I'm going to do just briefly now is touch on a few moments in history, less an attempt to kind of provide an overarching narrative, uh, but more an attempt to present a kind of underspecified prehistory that hopefully we might be able to evolve through the presentations and the discussions over the next coming, coming days. Now, the fascination with architecture and situations and action is obviously nothing new. Right In the late 50s and early 60s, Guy Debord and the Situationists railed against modern urban planning strategies involving the functional segregation and the rationalization of circulation patterns within the modern city. They introduced concepts of psychogeography and the derive as, means, as a means to promote spatial practices that privileged the embodied moment-to-moment -moment experiences of the city as both a research program as well as a socio-political agenda. Um, obviously, Constant's New Babylon project attempted to translate these theories into plastic form. Um, unfortunately, an attempt that ended up getting him booted out of the Situationists in 1960, although there's some discussion whether he resigned or whether he was actually uh, told to leave. Um, in another context, in the UK, architects associated with the idea of non-plan, as introduced by Raina Banham, Paul Barker, Peter Hall, and Cedric Price in this 1969 issue, of New Society took this issue, uh, or took issue with the established professional boundaries of the architect, uh, problematized the role of the official urban planner, and explored how the average person might seize control of the forces by which the buildings and cities surrounding them are designed and constructed. So at the scale of the individual building, this led to the questioning of whether or not a building once completed um, exists as a kind of completed artifact, so to speak or is to be understood as a perpetual work in progress. At the scale of the city, this led to the question of whether the power of the rational modernist plan to shape the use of space led to freedom and enlightened progress that it promised, or became a tyranny governing everything from matters of taste to the conduct of life itself. Now, more recently, you know, we're finding embedded technologies in places such as uh, building facades, right? Uh, Jean Nouvel's Institut de Mondorab in Paris is an example of a building envelope that uh, becomes responsive to the changing environmental conditions at the site. Here, the south facade of the building modulates the amount of light entering the building through a complex system of light sensors and mechanical actuators. Um, even more recently, UN Studios' collaboration with Arup Associates realized the Galleria department store in Seoul, South Korea. Right now, while large-scale urban screens have been around for some time, here, the entire building becomes a programmable screen that can respond to changing patterns of use or activity within or around the building. <laughs> Perhaps more compelling and less of a confectionary spectacle um, is the project uh, Blinken Lights by the Chaos Computer Club in Berlin. <laughs> uh, using a mobile phone, people on the street are able to play the classic computer game Pong on the facade of this building. Here, the building facade becomes a participatory surface within urban public space, inviting passing people to engage in the articulation of the urban, urban surfaces, vertical urban surfaces. Now, if anything, the mobile phone has already truly become a ubiquitous technology in urban environments, and that it is changing the way we locate, orient, and move through 
and otherwise inhabit the contemporary city is now, um, has been, it's been written about quite a bit. Um, considering the mobile phone use in Japan, for example, an almost overwhelming pe number of people in uh, the Japanese population own mobile phones, uh, most of which are equipped with digital cameras, SMS text messaging, wireless email, and internet browsers. Right? Mobile phones have replaced computers as the de facto email terminal of choice for many Japanese who are not in technology, finance, engineering, or other computer intensive occupations. Um, in this context, the mobile phone becomes a device for organizing space, time, and boundaries around the body in public space. Um, one's connections, constant connections with a close circle of friends um, has been referred to as a kind of personal territory device, which regardless of the context of the physical built environment or its public conveyances, uh, creates a social space which in some ways complicates our traditional categories of public and private space and urban environments. Um, further, the phenomena of pervasive gaming is another way mobile devices are being used to reorganize the way we move through and occupy the contemporary city. Uh, Can You See Me Now is a game that happens simultaneously online and on the streets, created by the UK performance group Blast Theory in association with the Mixed Reality Lab at the University of Nottingham. Players from anywhere in the world can play online in a virtual city against members of Blast Theory. Tracked by satellites, Blast Theory's runners appear online next to your player on a map of the city. Uh, on the streets, handheld computers showing the positions of online players guide the runners in tracking them down. So with up to 20 people playing online at a time, players can exchange tactics and send messages to Blast, you know, to the, to the people in Blast Theory. <coughs> Excuse me. An audio stream from the uh, walkie-talkies used by the runners um, allows one online to uh, eavesdrop on the pursuers, getting lost, getting cold, out of breath on the streets of the actual city, okay? So here's a situation where a kind of um, uh, online environment is influencing the way people are moving through and inhabit otherwise inhabiting uh, this, the space of the city. Uh, Dodgeball has a application, social networking application, which um, well to a certain extent maps um, techniques common to website, popular websites such as MySpace or Facebook onto the physical locations within ur urban space. Using SMS text messaging, participants share their current physic physical location within the city on the fly with friends they have associated with their online profile. Uh, Urban Tapestry is a project by the UK research group Proboscis um, in collaboration with uh, Natalie Jeremijenko is an experimental software platform for knowledge mapping and sharing. Um, it combines mobile and internet technologies with geographic information systems which allow people to build relationships between places and associate stories, information, pictures, sounds, and videos with them. Um, the Robach Feral public authoring uh, component of this project extends the platform to enable the exploration of local environments with electronic sensors to detect different kinds of phenomena and map them using online tools. Now effectively, the pr project asks what background environmental factors such as air quality, noise, and light um, pollution affect our neighborhoods. How can we measure this pollution in our own localities and make this data visible? <coughs> and finally, how does this change the way we understand uh, you know, the uh, local communities within which we're in, in which we're residing? Um, this is a project by WAG, the WAG Society, or W-A-A-G Society in Amsterdam, um, which mapped the movements of the city of Amsterdam, movements of people through the city of Amsterdam over the course of a month. Now here, mobile and location-aware technologies are being used to provide new representations of the city itself in terms of our daily movements and activities. Um, Real-time Rome, a project by Sensible City Lab at MIT, is another, is one of a number of projects today that are attempting to map the Hertzian space of the contemporary city. The, this project, aggregates data from cell phones, buses, and taxis in Rome to better understand the urban dynamic in real time. Here's one map which is showing the mobile phone activity uh, in the Stadio Olimpico during a recent Madonna conference, uh, concert, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Be interesting, as a Madonna at a conference with cell phone activity. Um, so over the next couple of days, really 
what we're trying to do is in one level uh, establish you know, or at least ask what new sites of practice uh, research vectors and working methods can we identify for the confluence of si arch architecture and situated technologies? Um, what opportunities and dilemmas exist, right? Given the shift from computing as a tool to computing as an environment, given the status or questioning the status of form in the material object and how it changes in a world of networked things, um, how attention becomes divided between virtual and actual domains, and how our constant navigation between these domains, um, or what the implications that has for the way we move through and experience architecture in the public space of the city. Um, further, how space is no longer just physically demarcated, but also inscribed through new forms of connectivity and social interaction, afforded mostly through mobile and pervasive media. <coughs> uh, so here, the shift from public space to social spaces, and finally, this questions about surveillance, security, and most importantly, privacy in this new domain. <coughs>